So, main issue last week was how to deal with the semantics of attitude reports with proper names, and more specifically, with proper names inside the complements of attitudinal verbs. <coughs> and um, so the sentence we look at is about the simplest sentence you can get of that kind, John believes that Mary is in Paris. And the main points of the treatment were that, on the one hand, uh, the speaker or producer, could be author, of such a report is subject to certain constraints if she is to use names in the complements of her <coughs> attitudinal verb. Um, uh, and they consist in, well, I'll say in a moment again, a little more. And on the other hand, the interpreter also is under certain constraints if he has to interpret those names correctly, this is once more the uh, display, the mental state description that I gave for the speaker if she is to make a legitimate and also a sincere use of that sentence. The sincerity has to do that with the, her having a belief to the effect of what you see over here. Uh, in addition to this structure over here, she's assumed to have three entity representations for John, for Mary, and for Paris. And what you see here is her representation of the belief that she attributes to John. And so that involves this at predicate that we encountered for the first time last week. And uh, that at predicate is actually a four place predicate. Uh, the first argument, the referential argument, is a state, and it's a state to the effect that the uh, attributee, John, um, is in a mental state himself, which also has entity representations for these two names that occur in the complement, and then a belief that makes use of these entity representations to uh, make a attribute well, a content. Or, specify content to uh, the entities represented here by the W and the C. So this is the way in which this is expressed. This is uh, MSDAT expresses, where DAT expresses that right now uh, uh, the person W is located in the CTC. And then there's a fourth argument, uh, which is for links between the uh, uh, producer S's own entity representations from A and Paris and the entity representations uh, that she attributes to John. Um, uh, in each case, it's the so-called distinguished discourse reference of these entity representations that they use to express this. This uh, says that uh, this entity of representation uh, marked by W uh, that John is supposed to have uh, refers to the same thing or represents the same individual as the entity representation as it herself has for Mary. So this sort of thing makes this belief uh, not just one with a singular content about these particular individuals, but a singular content about the very same individuals as herself is represented by these two entity representations. So that is what we did. And uh, today, as I already announced and very briefly described, we're going to look at a number of similar problems, but nevertheless importantly different, um, that you have with attributions also involving names in the complements of the uh, attitudinal verb, but where the name actually doesn't refer but is empty, like this name that uh, the French astronomer Le Verrier is supposed to have introduced for a planet that uh, turned out not to exist, it was meant to 
explain certain unexplained aspect of the motion of Mercury. But uh, anyway, so there was a short period of time where uh, presumably that's a story that philosophers tell at any rate. Vulcan was uh, thought to be the name of a proper planet by uh, Laurier himself and by some other people also belonging, I suppose, to the relevant scientific community. And I'm just assuming that that was right, whether that really is historically accurate doesn't matter. This is a story that you find in uh, Kripke's Naming and Necessity, and that's been taken over by a lot of people in philosophy since then. So um, I've already told you what's on this, oops, this uh, slide. But uh, what I'd like to emphasize is that what actually goes on as far as the name uh, uh, Vulcan is concerned. In this case is that Leverrier introduced it, he actually introduced it as part of a definition he gave uh, of this planet, specifying uh, conditions that he thought would uniquely identify it. And uh, so it's a special case as far as that's concerned of how you introduce names by definitions as part of definitions. This is actually an interesting subject. Um, definitions always come with a specification of what it is they define and a name for the thing or class of things that is being defined. So, um, when a name is introduced by definition, that was, so the story goes, goes also true for Vulcan, then it can spread through the community by the kind of mechanism that uh, Kripke uh, was the first to uh, suggest, where more and more people in the speech community get access to the name by getting the name from other sources, other speakers, uh, but also from texts. And um, so here, uh, there are the two sentences, and it's mostly going to be the first one over here, that we are going to have a closer look at, as I already said. So the point here is that if you know the story, uh, or more about the story of Vulcan, then you can recognize this as a sort of true, because uh, Le Valle actually it was part of his calculations that if this planet were to do the right thing, I mean, explain these uh, particular features of the motions of Mercury, then um, it would have to be closer to the Sun than Mercury itself. Uh, and if you look at this second attitude attribution, where the content is here that, that Vulcan is farther from the Sun than Mercury, that intuitively is false, false in the same way that this has a claim to being true. And the question that we want to ask is, is there any substance and what is the substance to this distinction, this intuitive distinction between this being true and that being false? And the problem here is that since we've got this empty name in the specification of the content of the assumption or the belief, actually, according to the normal rules of interpretation, this, that clause doesn't really express a proposition. Uh, and that's true both here and there. Uh, so in a way, uh, you might say, well, this is just as undefined, just as meaningless in some sense of meaningless, as this one over here. But clearly we have this intuition that the first is right in a certain way that the second is not. So that's the thing that we are aiming for, trying to understand what that difference between those two can be. And um, let me see where I had this. I thought I had... Uh, Okay, um, 
there. Sorry. Uh, so the point can be reinforced, I was just making the problem that we have here, by observing that if you have a sentence that's very much like the one we have just been looking at, but not as part of an attitude attribution, Vulcan is closer to the sun than Mercury. I mean, that's a statement that one, at least my intuition, maybe that's because I'm, my mind is spoiled by philosophy, but uh, I think it's, it's sort of plausible that this actually doesn't really express a proposition. You know? <laughs> what do you mean? There is no Vulcan. So the extraordinary thing about the occurrence of Vulcan in the complement of this attribution is that that particular conservation does not seem to be the end of the story there. So, what is now, yeah, exploring what the explanation of this phenomenon could be, we are going to try and find out by comparing two ways in which these uh, two attitude attributions to Le Verrier can be made, and especially the first one. And the first setting is that of two people, S and H, S the speaker, H the interpreter, who are in the same boat or were in the same boat as Le Verrier at the time. They too believed that Vulcan was an existing planet, and they, or as a trivia, speaking to H, that Le Verrier thought of that planet, that it was closer to the sun than Mercury. And so this is a case where S and H, because they share with Le Verrier the false belief that Vulcan is a properly denoting name, should, according to the algorithm or the, the, the analysis I gave you last week for John believes that Mary is in Paris, proceed in just the same way. We can assume that uh, both S and H have an entity representation labeled by the name Vulcan for what they think is the planet denoted by that name. And uh, so S will have to, in order to say what she says legitimately and sincerely again, have the same kind of um, representation of the, I'll treat these assuming as, as the kind of belief, the belief she attributes to Le, Le Verrier. Um, and uh, so here we have the first of two slides to show what this uh, representation, this partial description uh, of the mental state of S has to be for this utterance for, by her to be legitimate. Uh, and uh, so this is, so to speak, the outer shell, this cons an, 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 an MSD that consists of uh, entity representations for Olivier, Mercury, the Sun, and Vulcan. And here, in this particular case, I have actually specified one anchor taking it to be the only anchor in the anchor set of the entity representation, which is this definition that uh, Le Verrier gave of Vulcan, and that I assume uh, S and H, I'm assuming them to also be part of this community, also know. So this is a special kind of anchor that we haven't seen yet. Uh, it's one of a number of anchor types where uh, somebody is directly connected with what establishes establishes the connection between um, a name and its bearers, just in this particular case. Of course, this is wrong because this doesn't actually select an object. OK, so this is the first part of, the, of this, the outer shell of this representation. In addition to these four entity representations, um, as must also, like, like in the other examples that I uh, showed once more from last week, have a belief to the effect that Le Verrier has this belief that she, is attributes, that she attributes to him. And that is shown here. It's a very similar structure to the one we saw before, um, with uh, now uh, as attributing to Le Verrier um, a mental state described uh, 
in this way with these three entity representations for these three celestial bodies and his belief that uh, Vulcan is closer to the sun than Mercury. So that's what she is supposed to do. H, for his part, according to the principles that laid down last week, should also, in his interpretation of what she says, come up with a similar structure with entity representations uh, he, that he must have himself for these three celestial objects, uh, celestial bodies, and uh, in addition, uh, uh, a belief that Leverrier has the belief that the utterance specifies, and in addition, as we have seen last week, and that's going to be very important in the course of this lecture, he, uh, as I said, um, will, in response to the use of a name by the speaker, whether in the complement of an attitude, attitudinal verb, or elsewhere, his response must always be A, to have or accommodate an entity representation for the bearer of the name, um, and then add to the anchor set of that entity representation. We just saw again the entity representations have these three components, uh, something that says they are entity representations, and then a descriptive part and this anchor set. And uh, so what uh, H has to do is to add a vicarious anchor, as it's called, to the anchor set for each of the names that the speaker has used as a way of uh, sort of linking his entity representation to hers for the object in question. So that's uh, the primary role of these vicarious anchors. In the case where H has to accommodate a new ER for the interpretation of the name, it's the vicarious anchor that fixes its reference as the same. Uh, uh, as that of the entity representation that the speaker has used. And if, it, if H already had such a representation, then this uh, vicarious anchor that now is entered in whose anchor set by him um, is a kind of witness of a kind of reinforcement of this co-reference between his entity representation and the speaker's. So um, this is what I have already told you. Let me say one more thing in relation uh, to uh, these diagrams. First, on this slide, just a few small remarks. They're uh, not really very important. I've assumed here that the speaker uh, takes uh, Le Verrier. Oh, sorry, Let's see. I'm doing this wrong all the time. Um, that Le Verrier has uh, uh, French names that labels his ERs for these objects. And I've treated assume as a variant of belief. I've already said that, I think. Um, and, uh, oh yeah, I've already talked about this definitional anchor. Okay, so. Um, The point that I still wanted to make is that in these cases where the name occurs in the complement of an attitudinal verb, what I've shown you actually shows that what you get in these cases is a kind of three-place relation between the speaker, the interpreter, and the attributee. The speaker is connected to the uh, attribute via this link in the link set that we saw earlier. The interpreter will have a similar link between his entity representations for the objects in question and the uh, mental state he attributes to the attribute. And then there is this connection between the speaker and uh, the interpreter, which is made explicit by these vicarious anchors that the interpreter adds to the entity of representations to, uh, that he uses to interpret her use of those names. So, as I said, 
what H, S and H have been doing in this case, according to the picture I've told you, is exactly what I should have done. So in a way, yes, H has got an interpretation of what S was saying. And in a sense, it's true. But then I repeat what I said earlier. In other sense, it is false. And it is because uh, what all these beliefs, uh, the beliefs in particular, are actually ill-founded insofar as their descriptive content, as specified by S or by H, is not well defined. It doesn't uh, express a proper a proposition. Let me just go back one more time to this uh, slide here. So um, the problem is that this specification here of the content of the belief that S attributes to Grabozier is not well defined. And the reason is that, well, we also know uh, uh, that Rivier has a representation for uh, the Vulcan that is wrong because there's no Vulcan. And S has sort of taken that over. So this is not well defined. Uh, since this belief as part of this mental state description isn't well defined, uh, this whole thing doesn't, isn't well defined. So this at predication with this MSD in third position cannot be properly evaluated. In that sense, as I said before, S must be or can be uh, criticized for not really having said anything well defined. There is no proposition either described by this large DOS, which is the content specification of his own belief. So what can we say nevertheless about what's right about this attribution? To get a better idea of what that could be, we now look at a second setting for using, for uttering this first of our two sentences. Uh, and now by a speaker, and spe S, and speaking to an interpreter H, uh, that live today and that know this whole story, they know that, well, it was too bad, uh, this Leverrier's attempt to explain these aberrations and emotions of Mercury were a good try, but it didn't work. Uh, in fact, the uh, assumptions that he made ultimately turned out to be simply inconsistent with accepted physical theory. Um, so this speaker in this age will be in a different situation from the ones that we are just talking about. They won't have entity representations for Vulcan. The best that I can be assumed to have is something like an entity representation, but one that doesn't commit the one who has the representation to the assumption that it really does properly represent something. So there'll be an entity representation that is name labeled, Vulcan labeled, but it is a representation that, while it sort of allows H and as to use the name of Alton, doesn't commit them to the existence of such a planet. Let me go straight to where we have this entity representation that I, MSDOT, now assumes the speaker must have a in order to be able to do something with the name Vulcan, like uttering this sentence, but which doesn't have this commitment. And that's a sort of entity representation, a type of entity representation. I've called a pseudo entity representation yesterday because it doesn't really rep represent an individual. And I'm assuming that it has the following form. It's like an ordinary, Entity representing, entity representation having these first three components, but then there's something that actually says, 
Well, hold it. Um, this is not a representation of a real thing. There are various things that has to be said about what can be in the anger set uh, of such a pseudo representation. I'm not going to say anything about that right now, but uh, we'll, we'll see some of these constraints at all. So, um, now that we have pseudo entity representations with this additional component, it's actually quite natural to um, assume that the entity representation we've been using so far uh, also have something like that, so to make the unit notation uh, more uniform. So that they will have plus real as a feature here rather than minus real. You might even also want to consider entity representations that are neither nor, neither plus nor minus, a question mark real. This is when people wonder whether names actually are names of historical figures, or only mythical figures. This is the sort of attitude you can very easily have in a situation where there is a historical debate like there was, according to Kripke, <coughs> over the name Jonah, and there have been about Gilgamesh and King Arthur, and a number of examples like that. So uh, communities of people who argue over these questions, is this a historical figure or not, uh, would typically be divided uh, into three groups, the plus real <laughs> participants, the minus real participants, and the question mark real participants. And in the course of the debate, of course, uh, the entity representations that I have may shift, say, from question mark to plus, or question mark to minus, or whatever. Uh, new information persuades one or the other member of this community that the story is not quite what he thought uh, it was, or that he now knows what the story was, whether it was a historical figure or not. OK, so that uh, gives us then this subdivision of entity representations in those that are supposed to really refer and, uh, or represent, and those that are not supposed to, or we don't know. And our present speaker and interpreter will have, that was my assumption, now recast in this terminology, they will each have a pseudo entity representation for Vulcan and labeled with the name. And I'm assuming that uh, people who have such labeled pseudo uh, entity representations are also in a position to use the names but of course, their names, their, their use of the names will be different because they will treat them as empty names. So, I've already told you this. Here, then, we'll have, we have the uh, en pseudo entity representation that uh, I assume uh, our speaker as of today will have. For Vulcan, it looks like an ordinary entity representation, except for this minus real. Uh, it also has this definition in there, I assume. That is what it's supposed to be, but in this particular S, we'll know that actually this is a pseudo anchor. It doesn't really anchor uh, the entity of representation to anything that it really represents. So, the situation now for this new speaker, in comparison with the one that we looked at before, is going to be different in two ways. On the one hand, the new speaker will, when she has this uh, mental state that she must have in order, again, to make a legitimate and sincere utterance of this sentence, that Leverrier assumed that Vulcan is closer to the sun than Mercury. Uh, she must, um, on the one hand, have a different kind of link between the entity representation for Vulcan that she ascribes to Le Verrier and her own pseudo representation, 
it can't be a link of the same kind because, uh, that you had before, but those, because those links sort of signify that the uh, one whose representation it is thinks that her entity of representation is co-referential with the entity of representation she attributes to the attribute T. But that's not the case here, because she doesn't have an entity of representation for Vulcan, but only a pseudo <coughs> representation, a pseudo ER. So that different kind of link in the anchor set of the ad predication uh, uh, it has to be a different one. It's ideal, I'll denote it uh, with hats on the distinguished discourse reference of the entity uh, <coughs> um, representations involved. So in particular, for the case we are looking at, this link in the entity, in the, sorry, the anchor set, no, sorry, the link set, I'm sorry, of <coughs> this uh, complex belief that S must have, we'll, we'll see it again in the, in the new form in a, in a minute. <clears throat> that now looks like this. This is the discourse reference, the distinguished discourse reference of the entity representation for Vulcan that she attributes to Le Verrier. This is her own. And the hats just mean this is not a statement of co-reference, but rather a statement of these entity representations being linked in some other way. And that other way is one of the things we now have to make explicit. And then in addition, as I already said, uh, of course, uh, S herself has this pseudo representation for Vulcan rather than a normal entity representation. So this is now going to be crucial for the story. These vicarious anchors that we started talking about last week, they do basically two things, as I already said also today. In the first place, they have the function of either fixing or confirming the representation of the entity representations to which the vicarious anchor, anchor is added. That is, the uh, interpreter has his entity representation, say for Mercury. He adds a vicarious anchor in response to the speaker's use of Mercury. If he accommodates this entity representation of his for the sake of interpretation, the vicarious anchor fixes the reference of his entity of representation as the one that the speaker referred to by the use of the name Mercury that he's just interpreted. And if H already had an entity representation for Mercury that he now uses in his interpretation of what S says, then that is a further confirmation, an additional link to the entity, entity that the entity representation represented already. So that's one thing, and that's the primary thing that um, vicarious anchor does. But it also has the effect of establishing a kind of co-reference relation between H's entity representation and the one that he assumes the speaker S used or relied on when she used the name. So there is a kind of double function here for the vicarious anchor. On the one hand, it has to do with what the entity of representation to which it is added represents. That's the relation between H and the world. And on the other hand, there is this sort of orthogonal connection between H's entity representation and S's. And I already said last week, uh, 
though not very extensively, that this is actually the basis or the, for the MSDIT reconstruction, reconstruction of this causal chain theory of how names spread in the community that we owe first and foremost to Kripke. So in the case of these vicarious anchors, you might say this, this, this second function of establishing these intersubjective relations between speakers belonging to the same community is a kind of, you might even say, a kind of side effect uh, from this primary function of making one's own entity representation refer to whatever it is the speaker just referred to by her use of the name or some other expression. For these, I call them pseudo-links, with indicated by these pairs of these hatted discourse reference, we only have the second function. They also establish a link between the one whose entity of representation it is and the one um, who has made use of the name that this entity representation of the interpreter has as a label. But now, that's all there is. It's just a link between the interpreter and the speaker. So, if we think, I'm now going a step back to the vicarious anchors. If we think of the vicarious anchors as forming networks of entity representations entertained by different speakers belonging to the same speech community, this kind of network that also includes those causal chains that, uh, according to Kripke, uh, link users of names to the original event of the name being sort of uh, conferred on its bear, the kind of baptism. So we have these networks of entity of representations you get in the community. And these networks play a quite important role, and we'll get to that in a minute. Um, the pseudo links, like this one, do something very much the same, uh, but without the commitment of co-reference. So that's a different kind of relation. It also can be transitivized. H um, has a, or say, uh, S has a pseudo uh, link um, with uh, Le Verrier. And uh, well, in this particular case, it's not very plausible, but, but then uh, an interpreter of S may, who has also got a pseudo interpretation, pseudo entity of representation for Vulcan, may introduce such a thing in response to her use of the name Vulcan and so forth. So you get similar uh, networks uh, based on either just such pseudo-links or combinations of links and pseudo-links. Um, and there's a little structure there that I haven't fully understood, and uh, there's no time to discuss that in any case. But um, the important thing is that even with these pseudo-links, you also get that somebody with a pseudo-entity representation for Vulcan can be linked by a number of such pseudo links to somebody else indirectly. So we have this causal chain effect for empty names just as we have it for non-empty names. These networks, by the way, have an important one important feature of their structure is that, on the one hand, you can think of them as sort of synchronic. It's just the current members of the community that are connected directly or indirectly by such um, 
links that get established by vicarious anchors uh, and also by these pseudo anchors and pseudo links. Um, and um, there's also a diachronic dimension to it, of course, that's crucial when we talk about causal links that link us to the bearers of names that have been dead for a long time. And in any case, the causal things, when they link us to the bapti baptism that was earlier, have to have this diachronic dimension. There's one part of the structure of these things, which um, will be important, but I cannot say more about them. Um, and so now let us get back to the, I'll skip all this, Oops. the situation that we have with our speaker of today, who has, I'm just, it's just a repetition of what I've already said, uh, a pseudo anchor, a pseudo entity representation, sorry, for Vulcan, and who attributes to Le Verrier, a mental state with an entity of representation for Vulcan that is really an entity of representation. He knows that he thought that Vulcan really existed. And uh, so in this um, link set over here, uh, we have now this connection between uh, the pseudo entity of representation that S has herself and the entity of representation she attributes to Le Verrier. And then uh, there's a specification of Le Verrier's belief, which yeah, uh, is to the effect that, that Vulcan is closer to the sun than Mercury. That is something that she as knows to be ill-defined. But so the claim is that in this situation, she, the best she can do is represent what she thinks Le Verrier believes in this way. And the question now is, to what extent is that legitimate? She is doing something that she knows in a in sort of literal sense can't be right because this entity represented by this discourse reference for, that Le Verrier has for Vulcan is connected with her pseudo-entity representation. And that pseudo-representation is to the effect that, no, there is no such thing as Vulcan. So, same story about H, who interprets all this, but you don't have to go into that. What can we now say about this description, this specification on the part of S of what Vulcan believes. In what sense is that right? Well, if it had been the statement that Vulcan is further from the sun than Mercury, it wouldn't have been. Here, the proposal is that when S is doing this, she is actually taking, sort of putting herself in the position of somebody who believes that there is a Vulcan, although she really doesn't. And so her specification of the belief she attributes is correct so long as it expresses the same proposition that Le Verrier really thought he believed, in the sense that if we just consider all the possible worlds from his perspective, his epistemic situation, these are all worlds in which there is a reference to Falcon. To the extent that as is in a position to buy into this and say, well, what I attribute to him is what is true in precisely the same possible worlds for him as his belief. 
So it's a kind of make-believe that's involved here on the part of Earth. And it's the best one can do. And I think it's, that seems to be our sort of speaker's intuition. Also, enough one can do. What S is doing and what well, H will get if he interprets uh, what she says in the right way is an attribution uh, that actually is ill-defined on our own terms, but would be well-defined in Le Verrier's terms. And to the extent that it's defined there, it will coincide, will be equivalent to the content of his belief. When we now go back to our earlier pair of speaker and um, uh, interpreter, who were just as wrong as Le Verrier himself was about whether there was a planet Vulcan, we can now say, well, actually what that speaker tried to do and what that interpreter got is actually not something <laughs> that could be right. But in that case, you might say what the speaker actually was trying to express was, in spite of herself, unknown by herself, something that we can understand as being a correct attribution to Le Verrier, Le Verrier precisely because, again, the same doxastically possible worlds are involved. Exactly what the relation between doxastically possible worlds and really physically possible worlds is in this case or in another, that's a very deep and difficult question. And all I can say is considering these kind of attributions uh, shows us once, and once again uh, the situations in which that, which that distinction can be important. And uh, uh, it may help us for, perhaps in focusing on this more general question of metaphysics and epistemology. That is all I have to say about these two attributions to Le Verrier. And uh, so, uh, yeah, a last word about the earlier speaker. She was just as right and just as wrong as the later speaker who knows there is no Vulcan. What she is wrong about is just as Le Verrier what the really physical, physically possible worlds are. So in a way, she has an easier time making her reports because she shares, she's better aligned with Le Verrier than the later speakers are. In the very few uh, minutes that uh, I have left, I will say a little bit about uh, something that I, I promised for this entire lecture. And, uh, you yeah, I'm notorious for bad planning, so I didn't actually get to this topic, namely the use of names in fiction, until now, 10 minutes before the end. And so I apologize, especially to those who were looking forward to something on that topic. Uh, and what I do is, uh, next best, I will give you a brief summary of uh, what I had wanted to discuss in more detail. <coughs> and uh, the details, quite a few of the details, are in fact in a paper uh, called Sharing Real and uh, Fictional Reference that appeared uh, last year in a, in a volume edited by Emil Meyer and Andreas Stocker called The Language of Fiction. And uh, I cut out all the slides I made for uh, <laughs> the presentation here, but I'll uh, uh, restore them, so to speak, and uh, they will be found on the web page uh, as of, of the course, as of tomorrow or, or, or Monday at the latest. So um, let me just give you the basic ideas, and uh, I should start with the A uh, basic example, I'll click myself through this, uh, here. There are two points that this work is trying to address in particular about fiction. One is, what are fictional characters? 
that's a question of ontology, if you like. And the other has to do with the truth conditions, statements uh, about fiction in one way or another, and in particular about such statements that include or contain names of the protagonists of particular pieces of fiction. So here is an example of the sort of statement it's home court, but, but I think it makes the point well enough. Um, that I consider a particular challenge, and it's a, a statement that, well, it actually consists of several sentences, but um, it's a mixture of, on the one hand, statements that just try to say what's the case in the piece of fiction in question. This is all about uh, the Lord of the Rings. Uh, uh, in this paper that I mentioned, I follow Amar Maya in a number of details, and uh, in particular in the idea that uh, the information that we get out of a story that we read, uh, a fictional story, is stored in a special compartment devoted to that particular piece of fiction. Uh, and uh, it's represented in a certain format. I am assuming uh, that the format is given by MSDIT, and that, uh, for other details I spare you, uh, the uh, representation in that compartment is something like a very large DRS that gives the content of the story, and then in addition, or supporting it, Entity representations, pseudo-entity representations, because the reader doesn't really believe that these characters exist, uh, for each of the protagonists of the story. And now, uh, the point of this example is that this first sentence is true, to the extent that it is, but it, yeah, it is true if you know the story, by virtue of being entailed by the story as it's given, or more specifically, by the semantic representation of the story that the agent has in this special Lord of the Rings component. Um, and then it goes on as it's towards the end of the book. Now, <laughs> the Lord of the Rings doesn't talk about the book, as it is the book. Uh, and then I remember I was shocked and relieved at the same time when I first read this passage. That's about the particular agent's reaction to that. So these are really, I think it's the use of the term that other people uh, also make of it, these are meta-fictional statements. They are statements about what people, how people react to the story, what kind of points they make about it, who mentions the story last or a particular protagonist, and so forth. Um, and the truth regimes of these, I'm oh, sorry, <laughs> these different parts of this story, the one that does, tries to do nothing more than make statements that are verified by the story as it was given by Tolkien, uh, that's the sort of in the story P uh, kind of structure, but I think basically can only be analyzed as a kind of three value truth regime where it follows from the story, is contradicted by the story, and neither nor because the story never has a complete description of its uh, story world. And then these meta statements, at least the ones of the kind I've shown here, those really are yeah, statements of fact about what people said about the story or characters and how they felt. So that's a two-valued regime. And now the problem is to get a general theory for the truth conditions of such these various statements that can be made using these fictional names and were, in particular, uh, these mixed cases, like this one over here, are a particular challenge because, on the one hand, uh, there are bits that are 
uh, ruled by the three-value regime, value regime, and the other, the two-value regime. It's actually not that difficult to combine if you sort of know how to do it, in so far as the three-value regime is better described as a partial two-value regime. So <clears throat> putting the, 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 the fictional bit and the metafictional bits together gives you something that has certain bits that are partial and other bits that are not partial, the whole thing is partial. But the details actually are a little more complicated than I described them. And um, so um, the last, um, well, one but last thing that I want to say about this is that um, the question how you state the uh, semantics for these pure meta fictional statements um, is a problem that has to be solved first before you can look at these mixed cases. And that requires that you actually treat these fictional names as, you might say, ambiguous between uh, <coughs> standing for the protagonists in the story that's what's in this story compartment I was talking about. And they're used in these metafictional statements. There, this is one of the claims, so it seems plausible, uh, they actually <coughs> are not fictional names of hobbits and bulldogs and whatever you've got in their story. They are now names of things in our world the corresponding fictional characters. And so the other question then arises, what can be a fictional character? And here, my proposal would be, and this is a bit of ontological engineering, you might say, and perhaps you, some of you have a better idea. But what we want, and the only thing we can get as denotations of these names as fictional characters. That is, the only entities that we can hope to get as entities that belong to this world are things that have to do with these intersubjective networks that are created by the mechanisms that I was talking uh, about before today. And so this claim is that when you say something, uh, well, there's no name in the fiction, um, but a statement like Gollum is the most interesting figure in The Lord of the Rings. There, Gollum must be analyzed as standing for denoting the fictional character Gollum, and what that is on the proposal that I'm making is the network of pseudo entity representations labeled by Gollum on the part of all those who've read the story and uh, all those who have heard about the story from others and so they have this partial uh, control of the name Gollum, perhaps. Uh, so there is that network that actually gets established. There are people talking about uh, uh, the Lord of the Rings with each other, but also, of course, originally through the people reading the story. So there is, in addition to, in these networks, to the various uh, entity representations yet connected to each other uh, through vicarious anchoring in the way we have seen, also, the special link that anybody who's really read the story has between his entity representation for the fictional character, which is this network, and the pseudo entity representation that is in his Lord of the Ring, Rings compartment, where it acts as the name, say, of some, some reptile as opposed to the name of a fictional character. So that's in outline how this analysis of fiction works. Those that are interested in more can look at this paper or at the slides that I mentioned. And I want to end with <clears throat>
Thank you. And just to irritate Richard, Richard Suva, I've added a, a little addition to the thank you. Um, and I hope it's clear what it means. I thank you for being here, that you, quite a few have been, not only how now, today, but also on the previous occasions, and for the invitation that gave me the opportunity to present some of this stuff to you. <laughs>